Welcome to video one for week two. In week one, we talked about integrating over intervals in Rn. Now I want to integrate over a wider variety of sets, since there are many, many more interesting sets we have to work with in Rn than just intervals. This video is going to be the conceptual formal piece of the week. We'll get into calculations later in the week, but I want to set down good, solid, logical foundations for what's to come. So expect this to be a little bit abstract. To probably define the integral over arbitrary sets, I need to define something called a characteristic function. So if I have a subset of Rn, any subset whatsoever, the characteristic function of that subset, um, which is written chi sub s, I apologize for the notation here. Uh, this is not an x, this is a Greek letter chi, or chi, or chi, depending on your pronunciation preferences. This is a function that returns one whenever I act on something in the set, and return zero whenever I act on something outside of the set. So it's just a function that identifies the set, hence being called a characteristic function. So if I had chi of the rational numbers acting in the subset of the real numbers, the number line, if I act on one, I would return one because one is in fact a rational number. If I act with the chi of the rational numbers on root two, it would return zero because root two is not a rational number. So it's just a function that identifies whether, we're not, whether or not we are in a certain set. All right, so say I have a subset in Rn, and say this subset is contained in some interval. So if you think about R2, we've got some interval, we've got some subset here. So S is the subset, I is the interval. This only applies to bounded subsets, because I'm going to consider bounded intervals here. But that's fine, we can work with those. The definition of integration over the subset S is we integrate over the whole interval I, but we multiply by the characteristic function of the subset. This is an integral we can do. It's an integral over an interval, so it's well defined by the tools we used in week one. Week one said we integrate over intervals. The Riemann definition uses breaking up inter intervals into pieces. So that's what we need to know how to do. This is a way to extend that. How do we go from integrating over intervals to integrating over any set? Well, we integrate over the interval, but then we multiply by the characteristic function of that set. And what that does, that means that everything out here is just set to zero. So when we integrate over the interval, the things that are outside the set are multiplied by zero, and the things that are inside the set are multiplied by one. If this integral exists, if the integral of this characteristic function exists, we call the function an integrable set. Now, all of the functions that we, or all of the sets we will typically see in applications are gonna be integrable sets. Sets that are not integrable are pretty weird in terms of integration. However, the example that I used um, in the previous slide, chi q, this is the characteristic function of the rational numbers. This is not an integrable function. This is not an integrable set. And if you think about an integral on the number line, well, if we integral a number line, we're looking at areas under curves in one dimension. If I looked at the characteristic function, the characteristic function of q, I can't even draw that because it is zero at all irrational numbers and one at all rational numbers. There's no area under the curve to even measure there. It's got a bunch of zeros and it's got a bunch of ones and they're in no kind of continuous reasonable place. So it sort of makes sense that the integral of such a function wouldn't exist. So this, this integral doesn't always make sense. The Riemann integral doesn't always converge. But when it does converge, we say that the set S is an integrable set. If I have an integrable function and an integrable set, I should be able to do the integrals. Let's, again, formally, abstractly define that. So I have a subset of Rn, which is an integrable set. It sits inside a certain interval. I have a function which is an integrable, sorry, I have a function which is defined on the subset S. I can't integrate the function f directly because I still need to integrate on intervals. So what I do is I have a function that I can extend to some f tilde that sits on the interval. So remember my picture in R2 here is I've got the interval i, I've got my set s sitting inside it. So f, the function f is defined only on the subset to start with, but then I extend it by whatever purpose means to an integrable function on the interval so that the function f tilde can act on this entire space. 
So as long as I can make such an extension, I can try and define this integral. Then by definition, the integral of this function f over this integrable set s is the integral over the whole interval of the extension multiplied by the characteristic function. So again, if I, if I were to draw this, I have f acting on the set s, and then everywhere else I'm multiplying by zero. So the action, the things that contribute to the integral outside that, they're just going to all disappear. So multiplying by the characteristic set, multiply, characteristic function multiplied by zero outside the set s. And that gives me a well-defined integral for a function on an integrable set. If this integral exists, then the function f is called an integrable function. We get integrable functions over integrable sets. Again, all of the reasonable things we're going to come across in this course, the reasonable functions and applications, the reasonable sets we want to integrate over, all of these are going to work nicely. These limits are going to work. You have to go to some very strange, special kind of functions, things that mathematicians like to play about, play around with to see what the edge of their definitions are to really find counterexamples where this doesn't work. One last thing I want to say about this in this abstract video before I move on to more concrete things in the other videos for this week is if I have an integrable set then the and an, an integrable function on that set then the integral actually only depends on the interior points of the set and this is a really interesting thing this means that if I have a set which is missing something in the middle missing an individual point there in the middle I can sort of put that point in or remove that point as long as I don't have an asymptote. It doesn't really change the integral. Also, whether or not the set includes its boundary doesn't actually matter because all I care about are the interior points. I might have some improper integral situations on the boundary and I can deal with those with limits. But the, the idea that all I actually need to care about are the interior points is a pretty big idea that I'm going to come back to and use in future videos. And it's a nice thing to remember. The only thing to be careful again is asymptotic behavior near the edges. But if I have some something that's weird and undefined near the edges, I can I can ignore that. I can get rid of that and just consider the integral over their interior points. It's sort of a weird abstract thing to mention here, but it's it's a nice piece of the concept, a, a nice idea. You can also think of this as the fact that the boundary points for an integrable set are going to be of lower dimension. So if I'm integrating over area, well, the boundary is like a line. It's one dimensional. So if I'm integrating over two dimensional things, then anything one dimensional is essentially not going to matter. And on the assignment, I actually ask you to think about this, to think about what's going on with integrability and lower dimensional sets. So that's something for you to think about on the assignment. Think through these concepts and why they might work this way.